So you recently found yourself at the center of some discussion and debate over Noah and the Ark. Let's start with the beginning of that. How did how did that discussion and debate begin? Yeah, I put out a video arguing that the flood of Noah in Genesis 6 through 8 can be interpreted as talking about a regional event that was in a huge area of the earth, but not all over the globe. And I did that just because I know this is a topic that causes some people, especially Christians who are more scientifically minded, but also some of those looking into the Christian faith, this is a, a real issue for a lot of people. And I just wanted to help people understand some of the arguments for that view, help people understand that there actually are differences uh, within Orthodox Christianity historically. A lot of people are not aware of that. And uh, in my own journey on these things, and then the, in the kind of ministry I desire to have, I've just become convinced that we have to talk about these things, and we have to kind of try to help people understand what are the arguments on each side for and against. Sure. Yeah. And then you, ha you have salvation issues, and you have things that are not salvation issues, right? And, and so people tend to get um, very worked up about specific issues. The rapture, for instance, you know, we can go down the line on these things that people will dig in on. I think Noah's Ark is is one of those of those things, because a lot of people see the argument as one being a literalist argument and one being non. And so even this idea of a local flood, as you were saying, a lot of people maybe haven't heard about this. So what is your personal take now on this? Do you believe personally it's local? Do you believe it was worldwide? Where do you sort of stand on that? I incline toward thinking it was local or regional. Sometimes I use the word local and people think really small. So I'm trying to use the word regional more. Sure. Um, that's I'm not 100% sure about that. I, want, I really agree with what you just uh, said, that this is not a salvation issue. Um, now, if we were to talk about the truth of scripture about this, uh, that would be more important. But here we're talking about how to interpret these three chapters in Genesis. And it, there really is a good case, actually, that in its original meaning, um, the author and the, the original hearers wouldn't be thinking of planet Earth, all of the globe of planet Earth. So this is just a matter of interpreting scripture. But yeah, I incline toward thinking it probably was a, a, a local or regional event. And, uh, you know, there's lots of arguments for that. We have to remember that humanity at this point appears to also have just been regional. Uh, this is before the dispersion of human beings that happens after the Tower of Babel in Genesis 10 and 11. So all of human beings are in this one portion of the earth at this point before they had dispersed throughout the world. So that's one of the considerations that's really important here. Well, and that's actually an interesting of course, you know, when, when you think of it that way, someone could argue, well, technically it was a quote unquote worldwide flood from a human sense because the the entirety of humanity was there in one place, not meaning the entire earth, obviously, at that point, but where all of the humans were living, that that would be considered essentially, you know, a, a worldwide flood. So you could play with the wording on that. Um, but, but obviously, when you put this video out, and you're no stranger to putting out videos that might get reaction, obviously, on some difficult topics like, like this one, what happened? What were people saying? What were the responses like? Yeah, it was interesting. The YouTube comments were pretty much what I expected. Um, some disagreeing, some appreciative, kind of a mix. Um, but on Twitter, or X as I guess we now call it, there there was also a mix, but there was a lot more negative responses. And I don't know how social media always works, where something can sometimes get in the algorithms in, in a certain way, and certain people tend to run with it, and it becomes more visible in certain circles. But for whatever reason, yeah, I got a lot of reactions, and I wasn't actually that shocked by that. And nor did it phase me too much. As you say, I mean, this is part of the world we live in right now. But I, but I would just say my heart burns with a passion to try to help people experience assurance in the gospel. And this is an issue that causes people deep anxiety. And I think a lot of the reason for that is just because people have never learned about the history of the, you know, and I put up, put out a follow-up video just walking through the history of how many godly Orthodox Christians have held to this view. You can find the most conservative commentaries on the book of Genesis and study Bibles and other books by impeccably conservative evangelical scholars arguing for this view. I just think a lot of people aren't aware of that. So I think a lot of that reaction, if I, I don't want to be rude to anyone, but I do think it may have been coming from a place of maybe a more immediate response, not necessarily a very studied response. And so that's part of why I'm glad this is going on, hoping that this will at least cause people to think more deeply about this and maybe give some listening and consideration to why a lot of Orthodox and evangelical Christians have seen it in this more regional way.
Yeah. You know, one of the things people will probably throw your way and you've, you've seen this and I, I shouldn't say probably cause I have seen some of it. Well, you must be some sort of theological liberal or you must be, you know, talk a little bit about your perspective and who you are theologically. So people you know, understand where you're coming from in general. Yes, I'm an evangelical Christian. I believe in biblical inerrancy. I think the scripture is fully trustworthy. I think if people were to go down the line on sort of the some of the uh, average sort of testing issues uh, of our times, they'd find me pretty conservative, pretty classically Christian in my instincts. I have a high view of scripture and so forth. Um, but there are some of these issues where it, you're getting into the particular interpretation of a passage especially as it interfaces with science, where I just think it is more complicated. And I think, and I want to encourage people to give it some more review. You know, one of the things that I've learned in my studies on this is that historically, where, Christ, first of all, people have always, all throughout history, advocated for a regional flood. It's a minority view, but you can find it in the, even in the church fathers. Um, but also, uh, when you get into the modern era, and there's this discovery of the American continents, uh, you know, in the ancient world, people didn't know about planet Earth as a globe. And so when that discovery does happen, everybody changes in their views. Those who advocate for a global flood are also having to adjust and now account for a greater number of animals to get onto the ark, greater amount of distance to travel. And so they're having to come up with these ideas like rapid evolution after the, the, the flood, um, geological reshaping, you know all the mountains of the earth being formed through the flood. And those are new ideas as well. So that's one thing I would like to uh, just really make clear and put out there. All of us are responding to uh, the progress of science and knowledge about planet earth and having to adjust our interpretation of scripture accordingly, not because scripture is not true, but because we're trying to interpret what does the text mean in its original context, uh, viewing the world uh, from an ancient perspective and using language that reflected that perspective. When you when you look at this and you look at the biblical text and the lessons that you believe we're supposed to take away from it, do you see any difference between, you know, if you were to look at the story through a worldwide lens or a regional lens, does it impact in your view at all what we're supposed to walk away with as as believers? I'm so glad you asked about that. And the answer is no. I don't think anything of great theological consequence is at stake in the specific matter of the extent of the water. Now, there could be more if, if you advocated for a flood that wasn't universal with respect to human beings and human civilization. That might bring up some questions. But just the, the question of did it cover, you know, did it go to North America and Australia and the South Pole in terms of how widespread the water was? I don't think so. I think the main points are about God's faithfulness, God's covenant with his creation, the animals included, and then God's uh, promise of salvation. And the, the Ark of Noah is a type to point us to Christ, uh, knowing that if we have our trust in Jesus Christ, we will be saved from the ultimate flood, uh, the final judgment day, just as Noah was saved. I think that's the main thing that we want to draw from this story. And I don't think there's a whole lot theologically at stake. This is simply a matter of trying to interpret the scripture wisely with, with faithfulness to its original intention, and then just thoughtfully in light of what we know about the world today. Well, you have two videos, obviously, as you mentioned, they are, you know, 40 to 50 minutes. I think one of them might even be a little longer than, than that. And so there's a lot to cover in that. And so I'm going to ask you a question. It's a little bit of a loaded question, but, but what is it that would lead you and others, as you mentioned, this is not a new view and that's important to, to illustrate to, to sort of have a proclivity toward the regional. What is it, you know, scripturally that you see that makes you say, hmm, maybe it wasn't this worldwide flood as so many have said. Okay, I'll, I'll just run through my, my main two reasons here. The first one has to do with the biblical language and how the, uh, the Bible, all throughout the Hebrew Bible, how it uses language to refer to uh, the world. And basically what I do in my first video is I go through a number of examples where the biblical author, whether it's uh, in the book of Genesis or elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible and even in the New Testament, will use this seemingly comprehensive language, all the world or all the earth, every nation under heaven, this kind of language. Um, but it will be clear from the context that actually it's talking about a region. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, the gathering of Pentecost has every nation under heaven. Those nations are then listed, and they're all basically Mediterranean. 
in Genesis 49, the famine uh, of Joseph, it, it says all the earth came to Egypt to buy grain. Exact same language as you find in Genesis 6 through 8. In 1 Kings 10, all the earth comes to Solomon to hear his wisdom. And yet we know this is not the Aboriginal Australians traveling to the Middle East and the ancient Mayans traveling to the Middle East and so forth. So essentially the, the first appeal is just trying to interpret this language consistently. And then especially with Genesis 10 and 11, where, where these nations are all listed, they're all regional. And then it says in Genesis 11, 1, all the earth had one language. So it just seems like what the author meant to convey by all the earth was all the known earth, because people in that day didn't know about the American continents. So they would have no reason to use language to refer to those places they've never been to. So, so that's the first reason. It's just trying to interpret ancient language in, in how it was intended and not kind of imposing modern understandings of geology back onto it. And uh, I'll give my second reason here, and, and feel free to interrupt if I'm going on too long. No, uh, this is this reason... is actually very interesting and helpful. I think people will find it helpful to the discussion. Okay, good. Yeah, because I, I again, these are the things that I think it's helpful for us all to wrestle with, so that even if someone is listening to this and doesn't agree, they might at least understand why someone might have a good motive in interpreting the text this way. They're not just trying to throw the Bible away or something like that. Um, and the second reason is. When you really imagine what a global flood would entail, in light of what we now know of the Earth as a round uh, globe, um, it would it, it it forces you to multiply the number of miracles that would make it work beyond what the text of Scripture indicates. You have to try to find a way to to uh, transport all of these animals to and from the Middle East, especially special climate animals or special diet animals like. The kangaroos are only in Australia. There's certain animals that only live in the, the Amazon rainforest and so forth. They've got to get there and back afterwards. Uh, you've got to explain how they all fit on the ark. Every single animal species on planet Earth in the ark cared for by eight people for over a year. Um, you've got lots of other problems, just the quantity of water involved, uh, the mixing of fresh water and seawater. Uh, the survival of plants, and all this c comes together to make you say, okay, God is omnipotent, God can do anything, but when the miracles required for this interpretation go beyond what the text seems to indicate, you know, a, a lot of the these global flood proponents today have to posit what was not the general historical understanding of a rapid evolution of animal species after the flood, so as to account for all the uh, animal species that we have today. Um, these are things that aren't in the text. And so in light of that, it kind of reinforces the first point of maybe this ancient language is functioning in Genesis 6 through 8, the same way as in Genesis 10 and 11. You know, all the known world is what's in view. You know, as you sort of reflect on this and look at the reaction, and again, you're not new to this, but yeah, there's there's a lot of intense response when these sorts of things happen in general. What's some advice you have to people on both sides of this issue, on both sides of really any issue, people in the church, when it comes to maybe how we should discuss and debate these issues while using grace along the way? I'm really glad you're asking about that. And this is something that's probably on my heart on this topic even more than the actual issue at hand, because I'm interested in this primarily to try to remove it from being a stumbling block for people receiving the gospel my ministry and what I want to give my life to is uh, helping people find Christ, you know, and this can be a challenge for people. But I think the way we talk about something like this, the way we work it through in our disagreements is just as important as the issue itself sometimes, and in certain ways can even be more important sometimes. Uh, if we do not speak to each other with love in our hearts, and I'm saying this to my own heart as well right now, but, but all across the board, then those non-Christians looking on uh, observe that. It's been interesting to me to watch my non-Christian atheist friends watch this discussion play out. And I'm just so grieved at times. I, I really, I have to be honest with you. I think something is broken today in the body of Christ in how we communicate to and about one another on social media, especially on Twitter or X. We often communicate without grace, without love, without assuming the, uh, the best, 
uh, leaping to conclusions uh, with snark. And I've been so grateful for some times where to an extent we're able to have, I've been able to have some moments of progress and healing and, and coming back together in my own interactions, even on this issue in, in the last week or so. And that's been wonderful to see, but we need more of that on all sides, whether someone leans on this way or that way on this issue or others, all of us need to remember that the way we conduct our theological disagreements is a reflection of the gospel to those around us. And if we disagree, but we do so with love and with humility and with real sincere in our hearts listening, uh, that will be noticed by those around us. And that's one of the great things we should do right now to try to make the gospel clear to those on looking because our world is so hurting right now and desperate to see that. When they see real kindness, not compromise, but real kindness, I think that stands out right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, as Christians, we have to say to ourselves, we talk a lot about culture and lament culture, rightfully so. Are we allowing the negative of social media and culture to come into the church and impact how we are responding to one another? Because that is actually something I think we probably don't think about as much as we need to when we see these sorts of debates unfold. I saw you know, your debate unfolding, I reached out to you and I thought this would be an interesting conversation. And it truly has been and would love to have you back again. I'm sure there'll be plenty of other issues to talk about. Appreciate your time today. Thanks so much, Billy. Great to talk with you.